How's it going, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the IGDC podcast. It's been almost a year since our last episode, but yes, it indeed is happening and it's real. Uh, welcome to 2020. Um, I'm your host, Andy Flacati. You may know me as some guy on Instagram, and I'm uh, here with the IGDC founder, Holly Gardner. You can find her as Go Lightly on Instagram. How's it going, Holly? Hello. And uh, today we have an epic host, Mark yes. Allen Andre. Guest. Uh, guest. You're the He's, host. I'm the host. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent guest today, uh, Mark Allen Andre. You may know him for his architectural photos and uh, infrared photos, all kinds of things, many travels and things like that. Um, of course, he's always out capturing the weather and sunrise and sunset and I mean, pretty much everything in D.C. You Putting us all to shame because yeah. you can get up early. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's pretty <laughs> impressive. And, and you can follow him uh, on Instagram. His username is Mark Allen Andre. And uh, yeah, Mark Allen Andre everywhere. How's it going, Mark? It's going good. Thanks for having me on today. No thanks problem. Thanks for coming. Yeah, thanks for coming. Do you have any other accounts? Uh, so no, Mark Allen Andre, um, DC Infrared, and Mark Allen Andre shoots film. Film is a little fewer and far between, but it's it still happens. What do you shoot your film on? Uh, so I'm using now a Bronica ETRS medium format film camera. I, I don't know what that is, but it sounds it's big. <laughs> it's big and heavy, but Pretty it makes digital. some beautiful some beautiful images. You're like, are you the guy looking down like this at the? No, I well, I start. I did get a waist level viewfinder with it for a minute, but. I have a, I got like an eye level finder, so it looks more like a DSLR and behaves a little bit okay. more like a DSLR. I didn't realize you could even do that. That makes sense. It's like, a, it's what's, the fun thing about it is it's completely modular. Yeah. So you can just like put little bits and pieces everywhere and it just like adds to it and makes it bigger and heavier to carry around. So <laughs> you clearly know way too much about photography. <laughs> yeah. It's a little, it's a little, uh, how'd you, how'd you uh, get into photography initially? You know, growing up, it was, my dad was into photography and he always had his film SLRs around. Um, and it was just kind of always there, always omnipresent. And then, you know, I, I think I got my first digital camera in towards the end of my high school days and was playing around with it a little bit and then got a Canon power shot with a super zoom when I was in college and was like playing around with that and started messing around. And it was really cool because Canon at that point, opened all the work, their firmware up so that people could edit it and just like do different things. And so wow. like mess with the, fir like I didn't mess with the firmware, but I got a download for it. And like all of a sudden my super zoom could do like all sorts of crazy things and like do weird things that like DSLRs do now, but you know, a consumer level camera wasn't doing then. And so I started playing around like long exposure. I was, I was in Kansas at the time. So I was like, you know, storm chasing with you know quotes around it but like <laughs> you know trying to catch accounts, lightning accounts. and like and doing all that thing, you know driving around trying to catch cool clouds Ooh. and things and then i got a dslr as my graduation present from college and never looked back wow. i started how, how how long ago was that so like 10 plus years yeah so how old I, are you <laughs> <laughs> so i graduated yeah i finished college in 2011 okay so that's when i got my like first i'll call it my first real camera so you've been with Canon the whole time? Always. I've, yeah. I think the first digital camera I had was like an old Olympus. Mm. But then, yeah, Canon ever since. It's pretty funny that the power shot has like, I think I had that too, like starting. Yeah. Like I mean, every, it's, it was like, it was the easy thing back then because like it didn't have any lenses. So you didn't have to worry about like breaking stuff or losing <laughs> things because that's what I would have done. I would have lost something. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it was a great little camera to use and. I don't know. I did all sorts of weird stuff. Like I would set it up in the front seat of my car and take like long exposures as I was driving around, which was kind of fun. And have you ever set your tripod up in your car? Yes. Okay. I have I done, that. Say, I've done that too. Do that I still today. do that every you once in a while. Over the holidays yeah. Every once in a while I do do that still. It's still, it's fun. It's a fun thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> you had a great shot of the Capitol building, which we can show probably right later. Yeah. Yes. That was, that, that was, was cool. That was pretty cool. Yeah. And there's some, there's some cool things like driving around DC, experimenting with that and, just like seeing what happens. Like it's completely unpredictable. Yeah. That was cool. Rough so, roads help. <laughs> so tell us what is in your camera bag. If we run into you at the Lincoln Memorial, what's in your camera bag? So specifically the Lincoln. Yeah, probably, probably <laughs> either, 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 anywhere either, in the mall. It's either the Capitol or the Lincoln Memorial yeah. right now. But um, so I'm rocking my brand new EOS R right now. So I just got one over the holidays and uh, I typically carry my, the 24 to 70, uh, two, eight, I think it's the second Mark II from Canon. Mm -hmm. um, I've got the 16 to 35 28 uh, Mark II, and then the uh, 70 to 200 
to the, it. The Holy, Holy Trinity. The Holy Trinity <laughs> from Canon, yeah. And then I just finally got my new tripod kit put together. So that's like the new FLM from Canada. I don't remember the model number, but, um, and then I got a new architect or Acrotech, um, head for it. So I'm pretty excited about that. I haven't actually used that yet. <laughs> coming so, soon. Coming to the soon. Near yeah. here. <laughs> so, and then I've seen you work with filters. Yeah. So I use the, um, wine country camera filter holder. Um, you know, I've messed around with a couple Lee and I don't think I've used a Nissi one, but, um, the wine country camera one, what I liked about it is it comes with these metal frames that the filters flip into because it only took me dropping and breaking yeah. one glass filter before I was Which like, I got all, I, uh, yeah. Oh, I see. That makes sense. Breaking, breaking a $200 yeah. filter. It was like, no, I got, I'm, I gotta like, I gotta protect these. So that, and, um, but it makes it easy. Like there's, everybody's coming out with these new filter holder systems now, which I've seen a bunch pop up, but they all have things where you can like the circular polarizers Ooh. and things are all built in. So it's a really user friendly and photographer oriented system and you don't have to touch the glass. So it makes it easier to keep things clean. And it has like cool wood. Yeah. It has some <laughs> little like cool wood details that make it nicer to touch. Like, <laughs> it looks, so, it like when, it's, when it's like 30 degrees out and windy, like you don't have to touch cold metal. Oh, you just get I, to like, I didn't think about that. Touch that wood makes, and it's not, it's sense. not as bad. <laughs> but yeah. So yeah, that comes out some mornings, but not every, not everyone. Yeah. yeah I feel like I'd be using that all the time, but so I mean, much is set up. It's, <laughs> yeah. It, it just, it depends on how the, uh, how the weather's doing and how the light is. If it's really dramatic <laughs> and I need a graduated filter or if it's kind of dull and I need to like blur the clouds or something, I'll bring that out. But. Well, so that, that brings me to my next question is how do you plan? Do you wake up every morning thinking you might go out or do you sort of look at the weather before you go to sleep and think tomorrow might be a good day? Because I know you do a lot of sunrise. Yeah. I mean, sunri so I, so I like sunrise out? because it's kind of, it's nice and quiet, but um, you know, a lot of it is when I have time since I work full time and, you know, photography is a, a hobby, but um you know, a lot of times I'll just, I keep an eye on the weather. I've always kind of loved weather anyway. So I just mm -hmm. kind of like watch it, monitor it. And mm -hmm. it's where like Capital Weather Gang is like my favorite because they really, really good about giving you these great forecasts. Um, but I use the photographer's ephemeris and their Skyfire subscription to help kind of predict and think about what quality the sunrise is going to have. Um, but even on days where I would well, I'd like to go out and Skyfire says it may not be great, um, I do a lot of planning using like the national weather service has all of their satellite imagery available on their mm -hmm. website. And a lot of it comes down to just like looking and seeing like what's happening generally with the weather. Like, is there a storm system moving in? Because if I'm out for sunrise, right, I want clouds coming in from the mm -hmm. West and I want clear sky, mm -hmm. sky to the East so the sun can get under the clouds. So a lot of it is just kind of a gut feel and, some mornings you go out and it doesn't pan out, but it's still okay because I got to be out for sunrise and that's still kind of a nice thing. It's like nice and DC's quiet at that time and it's mm -hmm. just kind of peaceful and it's wild to see the difference. Like when you're at like the monuments and there's just no one there. <laughs> yeah, and it's I mean you know even when I travel, that's like the really nice thing is sunrise is just you can it's you can be more contemplative, you can be more focused, and it's just like a a nice time to be out. It kind of psychs you up for your day too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But you spent the Pat Patagonia, right? Yeah. So last April, I was in Patagonia for a week, which was unreal. It was also nice that sunrise when I was there was at like eight thirty in the morning. So oh wow! <laughs> like I didn't have to get up at like four a.m. to yeah. make, to catch sunrise. That helps. Um, but there, and then there was one day where I got up and I did like a two-hour hike to get to a spot for sunrise, which was it was interesting being on a trail in the complete darkness. Now there were other people going out and hiking at that time too. Do you headlamps or? Yeah. So it was like, it was funny. You'd be going up because you were, it was like, I don't know. It was like a two and a half mile hike up to this one viewpoint I wanted, but it was like 1200 feet of vertical gain. So it was like, you could see, you, and you know, the first part of it, they kind of switch backs along a ridge and you can like see the other groups up ahead of you with the oh with their headlamps and everything. And you know, I'm sitting there thinking, I'm like, okay, as long as there are no mountain lines around, I'm going to be fine. And you're by yourself when you do this typically. Yeah. Right? I mean, the, you yeah, travel I typically by travel by myself, yeah. travel by myself, but you know, there were a lot of other people around on the trail and you know, it's just, you make noise. So the animals know you're coming and they, cause they're, they're more afraid of you most times than. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that sounds far. Was the sunrise good? Yeah, that day was pretty good. There were some little wispy clouds around Fitzroy that were pretty that were pretty beautiful. Um, but yeah, it was 
I don't know, the hike up and just being able to like sit there at sunrise oh, yeah. was just like completely worth it. Well, it's like euphoric after that the long of a time. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, so it was like a two hour hike up and then you just kind of get there and you're rushing around because like I got there and it was like 30 minutes before sunrise. So I was trying to find a composition and do all that, oh, you yeah. know, get set up and everything. And it also like that was literally the first day I was in El Chalton and it was like I had dr- taken an eight hour drive and it had been rainy and it actually snowed around Fitzroy the previous day. So it was like, cold and then there's like these little wooden bridges that are kind of sketchy that you're crossing little creeks oh, and so wow. it was like it was like not the easiest thing to get up there and then you kind of get up there and you're just like it's just kind of a nice release and then i mean wandering around there was it was unreal it's an amazing place. and yeah the two hour hike back also right yeah well i'm like so i ended up i think i took like i took like another hour Uber? and a half and kind of walked what? around um because there was like so i think i ended up doing seven miles of hiking that day because there was just like a lot there's like some cool waterfalls off in like in that area that you have to like go off trail to get to which was kind of fun um but yeah it was just like an amazing walk and then yeah i kind of took my time going back down and hiking poles that was the key for going oh. down wow. I've never used hiking poles. So you travel a lot. We we all know this who follow you. Do you, when you look at a map and you're trying to figure out your next location, is it all about photography? Is it about where do I want to go? Where do I want to take my lens? What do I want to see and capture? How do you approach I, travel from a photography standpoint? When, I, when I'm trying to figure, well, mm. I'll step way back. Whenever I'm trying to figure out where I want to go, um, I like to use photography as an excuse to get out and see something cool. Um, there's a photographer I love, Jim Richardson at Nat Geo, who said, if you want to take more interesting pictures, put more interesting things in front of your cameras. I'm paraphrasing, so it might not be the exact <laughs> quote, but like, pretty good that. Put, so put something more interesting in front of your camera. And as much as photography, I love it. It's a hobby. It's also just an excuse to get cool places. Mm-hmm. And so... I think without photography, I would not have traveled. Like my first international trip was to Iceland when, you know, in 2015, when I think everybody was trying to go to Iceland <laughs> at that point still are, but like Iceland, the Faroe Islands, Scotland, like all those places, probably I might not have gone if I wasn't mm-hmm. as into photography. Cause I just wanted to go see cool things. And, um, you know, I, I like to use Instagram and a lot of the online communities, 500 pixel, like Flickr, all those groups to like figure out what is the, um, what are the cool things where I'm going to go? And then I use um, Google actually has a cool feature. I think it's like web browser only, but you can actually drop pins onto mm-hmm. a map, my oh, yeah. maps. Yeah. And so I just have this like library of when I see something cool online or in a magazine or whatever, I'll just go in and drop a pin on a map. And then, you know, I'll start to see like a little cluster develop around places I want to go. And then that's where I'll start to say, mm-hmm. okay, I'm going to go here. That makes sense. Or, you have the same similar yeah, kind of I, I map, just, right? You can do it on mobile, but on that. <laughs> well, you can do it on mobile, but it's like, it's much easier to do from your computer. Okay. Well, I mean, like, but what's great easier, is that yeah. you can access it through yeah. the Google Maps app. Right. So whenever you're traveling anywhere, like you can have all that information and be accessible and build links in and show, put images into mm-hmm. it and everything. And it makes like, again, I try to find cool things I want to go see. And then that's where I'll go rather than saying, okay, I want like, I want to go to this city without kind of having an idea of what I want to do. But it's, you know, there's, I always love to go see cool architecture when I'm there too. So it's like all those things kind of build into each other, but landscape photography has kind of like been the nexus for cool traveling to far flung cold places. Well, so you are an architect, architect. So, um, yeah. How do you think that affects your photography or travels or, I, you know, I think it's, it's been an influence in terms of how I think I like kind of construct my images. Um, you know, going through architecture school and seeing images of kind of icons of architecture and especially in 20th century architecture, um, they're very kind of clear compositions, you know, it's in trying to create something that doesn't ask the viewer to like infer a lot of things about what's going on, but kind of helps them understand the space. Um, you know, and something that's not overly, like overly edited, something that allows you to kind of, but still lets you understand the emotion of the place and the mm-hmm. space. And so I think that's kind of come into my images. I think I had a friend that described them as like, my images as being very clear and structured. I think that's like, it makes a lot of sense about like how those things come together. Because if I think about great photography that I was introduced before I was really into photography, it was really architectural images first and then exploring, you know, 
landscape photographers like Ansel Adams or, you know, some of those other icons, but it's, it's had an impact. Natural architecture. Yeah. Yeah. Natural architecture. <laughs> so what about DC's architecture grabs your attention and focus? I know you shoot a lot of the Capitol and more of the classical buildings, but how does DC fare on, on the architectural interest map? I mean, the, th the interesting thing okay. about the interesting thing with DC is that it like kind of grew up in the second half of the 20th century into like a really major city. So there's a yeah. lot of buildings that kind of come into like from modernism to brutalism to mm -hmm. postmodernism kind of in DC. And modernism, you know, really is like a kind of big catch all, but it is really kind of where I gravitate to from a style perspective. And so there's a lot of things in DC that I like. Um, you know, like the Health and Human Services headquarters, the HUD building, um, the Hirshhorn, you know, there's all these things. And, and DC is also like, you wouldn't, it's not well known for it, but there's a lot of buildings by really, really amazing architects here. Um, you know, Gordon Bunchaft did the Hirshhorn. He's one of my favorites. Um, but then you've got a lot of like I pay projects here, like the East wing. Mm -hmm. um, but then he's also got a bunch of like office buildings in DC that he did, that his firm did. Um, so there's just a lot. And like, he, I believe his firm did the like four seasons in Georgetown. Like there's just all these little things, these like, little kind of hidden gems. Do you know yeah. all this because you're an architect or <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, this is, this I'm is like, wow. completely <laughs> like, I have nothing to do with this book, but there's a great, a, guide to Washington, D.C. that talks about, it goes through like every single neighborhood mm -hmm. from like old cool houses to new modern buildings that kind of walks through everything. But it's, so it's kind of a different world, but I also like the way that D.C. has this like green fabric that ties it together. So, you know, all the little circles, all the little corner right. triangle parks and everything mm -hmm. that make D.C. more of a green city where it's not just a kind of unrelenting architecture, but it's also this kind of like fabric of nature and architecture coming together. Um, and that's where I think the more longer I've been in DC, the more I've gravitated towards kind of landscape photography just because it's a little bit different, but, yeah. um, well, you, know, you probably just, stare at architectural things all day, I assume. <laughs> yeah. So it's, and it's just a little different, it's a little different aspect and it's a little, you know, it's photography and architecture are both creative and technical at the same time. So it's kind of a, it's an interesting, creative escape for me from my day job. Yeah. Does your work ever make you take photos or do anything with that? Uh, you know, a lot of what I do related to photography with my work is actually working with the architectural photographers to actually document our space, the spaces oh, wow. we're designing. And so it's, you know, I've worked in several different cities with, with several different photographers over time, kind of documenting our spaces. And that's been kind of a role. I think it's, since I speak both languages, it kind of helps like, Bridge yeah. the gap and mm -hmm. work with those people. Work with the photographers. That's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. but it's it's amazing because I we work with some of the like big names in the industry. I mean, there's people like one of the guys we work with learned from Ezra Stoller, who's like the the <laughs> guy in architectural photography. So it's mm -hmm. it's a it's a really fun thing to be able to kind of have that bleed into work a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you also do infrared photography, also, right? Yeah. So infrared, yeah. that's a whole other animal. <laughs> It seems like you've just done like everything in photography. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, infrared was cool because I don't even remember how I saw my first infrared image. But when I got my previous camera, my 5D Mark III. Well, for people who don't know, what is infrared? So infrared photography, it's basically um, mm -hmm. a narrower spectrum of light. So everybody's aware, you know, everybody I think has seen like an infrared heat camera, right? That's picking up the heat coming off your body, but it's... When you talk about infrared photography you know, in an image standpoint, it's really kind of near infrared. So it's infrared images that are just beyond the visible spectrum. And um, so there's all sorts of different filters you can get and you can do just lens applied filters. You can actually modify a digital camera so that it's just only seeing infrared images. You can do like full spectrum where they just take filters. They basically take a protective filter away and then you know, you're applying, you know, you're seeing everything. So you're like, if you, every camera has a built-in filter that take, that prevents infrared light from hitting the sensor, mm -hmm. I think partly to protect it, but also because it can have some unwanted side effects. Because what's crazy about infrared is the way it handles like greenery and, and like plants. So there's like, basically every leaf reflects infrared light. And so 
what I've got is I have a my Canon 60D, which was my first camera, I, you know, first DSLR I ever got. But they so they take away that protective filter, and then they you modify the camera and you actually put a filter that then mine blocks all visible light, and then it only lets in light. And the company does that. So oh, they do it. Okay. Basically, I send the body away, and then you they basically are take the filter off, put the new filter on, and send it back to me. So anybody that's interested in this, you can have any of your cameras converted and modified to do. Yeah. This. So there's and there's a few companies that do it out there. I did mine through LifePixel. There's another great company called Clary Vision, and Clary Vision and LifePixel both have really great resources in terms of getting into it because then you've got to like build your own Lightroom profiles for your camera. There's all sorts of like crazy things that happen with it. There's like a ton of editing involved, right? Yeah, there's a lot. Well, there's, there's like an initial setup and then you kind of work through it and you can do some really crazy things. And there's like tons of really cool, like really amazing images out there of like Central Park. And I think a lot of it comes into how you are kind of dealing with landscape and the built environment. I mean, like glass just behaves completely differently in infrared light. Like some glasses become completely opaque because most modern buildings are like trying to prevent infrared wavelengths oh. from coming in to prevent heat gain. Wow. So they're reflecting it. So it becomes like kind of almost black. You're not seeing through it. Like fabrics behave completely differently. Like we could all look, our shirts right here could all look the same in infrared because they all reflect infrared light in the same way. Mm. So it's like, it's it's just a completely different way to see the world and and see it and that's what I think I was kind of drawn to was just like seeing something differently that was not what you saw. It's all, it's almost like as if everything on planet Earth had happened completely differently and our eyes were only adjusted to infrared. That's what the world oh, would be yeah. like. I, didn't think about I always that. kind of look at everything that I see in infrared and, and it lo sort of looks like a big winter wonderland in a way. When yeah, you do like green spaces, botanical gardens and stuff. So it's always it kind of transports you into another world. It's well, and I, I personally like black and white infrared mm -hmm. images. I think it's a little more classic, a little. Mm -hmm. That's just where kind of my aesthetic is gone. There's a lot of people doing really cool stuff with like color shifting the infrared images where you get these really otherworldly colors where things are pinks and greens. And, you know, is like that all editing? Or is uh, it like it's it's a combination of like so there's several like filter like wavelength filters that you can get and oh, each okay. one has a different impact with the color because the closer you get to the visual so the, to what we see to the visual spectrum the more some colors start to come into the infrared image I'm a little further away from the visual spectrum so it's more of kind of a monochrome image but you can still do channel reversing in Photoshop to like make what is red in the default image come out as blue or mm -hmm. pink or yellow or magenta. Like you can just, you can, you have kind of complete control because it's so unreal. Mm -hmm. You can kind of really let your own creative, like. So it sounds like if through. you get the company to take out this filter, you can like swap out. Is, is that like yeah, a lot, it's, a lot of Well, you, so things? you, there are ways that you can set it up to where it's more easily swapping, like you can okay. swap it out more easily. And that's where the full spectrum conversions come in because you can put a filter on the front. The thing that I found, I uh, tried okay. a filter first and what I liked is now I was using it with the infrared blocking filter. So I was having to do like 30, 40, 50 second exposures in the middle of the day to get anything out. And your lens also doesn't focus properly by default at that wavelength. So oh, wow. you have to have them reset the focusing mechanism in your camera to fo like, so it focuses properly. And so that was like, it was like this whole mess of like really, really challenging technical problems. And I was like, well, if I send it away, they'll set up the live view focus <laughs> and all this stuff for me yeah. so that I can just handhold it and like work benefit. through it, like benefit from it. So yeah, it's like, sounds that's like that's the way to go. worth every penny that, you know, you spend on it. And what's cool too is now it's, there's a, there's a whole kind of community online around this too. So there's tons of people with really, really amazing, you know, setups from just to walking you through the initial setup to how you can edit and do all these different things. And, you know, you can buy, you can just go to these companies too and buy a camera. You, like, you don't have to send them a camera. You can just buy a new camera that's got the conversion mm -hmm. already done. Yeah, I just did it because I had a body sitting around collecting yeah. dust, and and a lot of people have like you can do just a point and shoot because a lot of people, a lot of us have those just laying around. Maybe we our first camera or whatever. It doesn't yeah. have to be a. a it, it, yeah, it doesn't. You, they'll do it to almost anything. Yeah. I think 
I think there are e people are even working through infrared drones right now. Like they'll oh. do, oh, they'll cool. do the conversion on drone cameras I thought it would as be well. Funny also, I you know I don't know if they're doing. <laughs> I, I haven't looked to see if they're doing it on an iPhone on a phone wonder. yet, but they're doing it on every level of camera, which is pretty cool. So speaking of infrared and your architecture and your landscape shots, is there? You obviously challenge yourself. Like that's not a question. Um, but is there? Have you ever challenged yourself to create a series of or a, based on a theme of something? Like I know a lot of photographers will say, "Okay, I'm going to go and travel Route 66 and just take photos of abandoned gas stations or something." I don't know. Just a, an example. There's, but do you have anything that you've done there's, um, or plan to do? There's a series that I've done very slowly over time that I'm kind of in the middle of trying to work through. Um, I started this a long time ago and I had just done like some really long exposure shots of like the planes coming into land mm -hmm. at Reagan, like, mm -hmm. cause with that flight path and following the river, like they, it's really bendy and everything. Mm -hmm. And I've started a series where it's like these super long exposures of, you know, almost, they're not like hour long exposures, but an hours, like an hour of 30 second exposures kind of stacked together. Mm. Um, so I'm kind of in the middle of that and always trying to find new little visualization points where I can like see these cool things. I've got like five or six images in that set right now. Um, that's, like, a, that, that's like the photos with like 30 planes and they're all like, yeah, slightly, yeah. well, it's yeah. You're not actually seeing the planes because it's all at dusk. So you're just seeing the light trails okay, of okay. the planes. So okay, I see. Because um, so, other people do like the daytime. Yeah, and yeah. And there's, yeah, a lot of, you know, I think it's really cool when you look at, you know, places like SFO or LaGuardia or JFK, these airports that just have massive amount of traffic. Yeah. And these guys, and they do those stack things where they literally catch planes coming in. And then you see like a day's worth of planes in one image. And it's like, blows my mind. <laughs> um, but yeah, I was, I was kind of interested in like the notion of seeing the movement of the planes and actually seeing the path that they're yeah. flying as they come in because it just it you're moving so much as you come into that final approach that it's like really really interesting and yeah cool. oh they all aren't like exactly the same line or there like, no i mean there there's some variation yeah and that's kind of the cool thing is you start cool. but you but it aggregates and yeah. creates the path oh, which okay. is really really that's interesting pretty cool. and it's a cool place to do it because you get the you, some wherever you set up you can get sometimes the monument well, and you can get you know it's I've a been, nice like, path I, I have a cool one with you know, where all the planes kind of look like they're going behind the Jefferson Memorial. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. The other thing is with, like, Rock Creek Park and some of the other roads that are around, or, um, or the George Washington Parkway and, like, a couple other places that are around. What's cool is sometimes you get the planes and, like, traffic moving in the same direction. So you actually get, like, these light trails in the ground and in the sky kind of converging mm -hmm. into the same place. So there's some pretty cool opportunities there. And, like, I always have in the back of my mind of, like, when like where I can go and trying to find new vi new viewpoints for that series. Um, I also have a really cool series that I came on to kind of by happenstance. I was at the Netherlands Carillion for 4th of July one year. Oh, yeah. And it was like, I like the wind changed right before the fireworks. So like all of a sudden the wind was blowing all the smoke towards me. And I always thought that like all the setup that they got, that, you know, security that has to happen for 4th of July always felt like I was in like a dystopian, like apocalyptic, like <laughs> movie where like everything's shut down. The city's been shut down and like, you're like running for your yeah. life from something. And this one year, it just so happened that the smoke was blowing through as everybody was leaving. So walking from Netherlands Carillion back to the Roslyn Metro, it was like the sea of humanity and it was like <laughs> foggy and smoky. I remember this photo. And then, it was also cool because then, you know, you've got like the police armored cars that are there. So it like adds to it. It was just like, it was really unreal. And I was like, okay, that, that was kind of a cool, like happenstance. Like I've got like 10 or images in that or something that was just like kind of wow. amazing to. There's one that sticks out in my mind that always, that I always remember from the series. And it always has reminded me of like zombies walking towards you. Yeah. Yeah. Cause there was <laughs> one where it was one of those like, like big people, light yeah. stands. And then there's like this like line of people that are like With walking cl cloud of and smoke it's just behind like, them. it's so it was unreal. And I was just like, okay, I have to, I had, to, I had to take that, yeah. but I, you know, I haven't, I haven't kind of pushed myself to kind of pre-plan a ton of those series. It's kind of, I, I like to kind of be reactive to the weather and, and I'm, I've always been fascinated by weather. So it's, I think growing up in the Midwest and having those crazy thunderstorms and things around like brings that out in me, but. So are we going to see Mark go on 
a storm chasing photography. You know, tour I've soon? always I've always said that like if I didn't have to worry about money, I'd just go be like a storm chaser yeah. in the Midwest. I think that would be fun. The I feel like I don't know the way I tra- plan and travel. I feel like the storm chasing vacations are hard because like I could go out and not see anything, right? And that's like I'm all, like I'm ter- terrified of that. Like I would like go out and I spend a week in a 15 passenger van with a bunch of people and like come back with nothing. nothing. Um, I don't think you'd come back. with nothing. I don't think you'd I'd come back. With, I'd find something, but it like I don't know. I've they're like bucket list things. Like I've always I've even though I grew up in the med- mm-hmm. Midwest, I've never seen a tornado. Mm-hmm. Like. You know, been in a basement when tornadoes are, you know, a few miles away and things, but I've never seen one. And so I always wanted to see one. Yeah, I assume it's super dangerous. Scary. Yeah, I mean, it is It is really away. dangerous. And that's why We've you like Twister. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, and that's why, you, that's why you go out with people that are like meteorologists right. and understand this and are, you know, do this for a living because it's, it is incredibly dangerous. Mm-hmm. I mean, even those trained people die. Every yeah, year, yeah. and that's the thing that's like terrifying about it. Is yeah. like it's so unpredictable, but I, I do want to do it eventually. <laughs> but exciting, yeah. I, it's, it's, I, I mean, like there's there's, there's, something, there's something there's something there's something exciting about it. I think just take sabbatical and do like two months. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I actually, I follow a lot of storm chasers on Twitter, and that's like I think I always get in like April and May every year. I'm always like on Twitter, and I'm like I have some serious FOMO. Like there, I'm always like, oh man, that'd be it. Sounds like fun, but I mean, it's it's. You know, it's also one thing it's, it, they'll, they'll always say this, which is like, it's more about documenting the weather and it's more about helping to kind of, kind of catch the, you know, help understand weather more, you know, storm chasing is storm chasing, but it's out there doing that to help, help save everyone people. and save people. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, you don't get the advances we've made in meteorology and things without people right. going out there and trying to observe the storms. Yeah. And, oh, we've seen Twister. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There were plenty of advancements made. <laughs> Those balls. Yeah. Um, is that real? Was that real? A real thing? In Twister? I actually don't know. I don't know. I don't. I, don't, I, I would assume it, experiment, right? I assume it was based I on something. It probably is based on something, like even though it's not right? like I don't know. Not a maybe not as real as it was portrayed. But we know nothing about storm chasing <laughs> and meteorology. But be safe. Oh, Mark, Mark <laughs> don't try this at home. Mark knows everything. Yeah, don't try this at home unless you're a professional. <laughs> Or you were with a professional. Yeah. So why did you initially get on Instagram? Oh, that's a great question. And, Actually, and, and, and how did you pick your username? Um, okay. <laughs> so it was really funny because, you know, I think when I was like starting to take image, take myself more seriously <laughs> as a photographer, I was I think I actually like didn't like Instagram. <laughs> and um, my friend Samir was like, dude, you got to get on Instagram. I think I like held it off for like a good year. And then I don't remember if it was 2012 or 2013 when I like finally bit the bullet and got on. And my, I picked my username because I was like, I had started using my full name in like student government in college. And like <laughs> people were like, you're either going to be famous or infamous, one or the other. There's no like using it with that name, it's either one. And I, uh, I was there's like, still time. Well, yeah, I was going to say, there's still time. <laughs> I was like, I should just like, I should just use my full name. We'll just see how, cause like, I don't know. By that time I figured like all the good stuff had probably been taken on Instagram already. So I was like, well, I'll just use my full name and it was still open. So I got it. And now I like every time a new social media comes out, I have to sign up. So I get my name. <laughs> what would it have been if you didn't do your name? Ooh, Storm, I have no Storm idea. Chaser. <laughs> I have no idea. Probably, one. probably something that would have re- reflected like my ridiculous interest at the time, which it's like, I don't know, my, my old Gmail account is like Tiger Maniac, which is when I was obsessed <laughs> with like, like when I was like obsessed with Tiger Woods when he was like, you know, in his oh, prime, nice. it was like, yeah, I was like, this could go a lot of ways. <laughs> yeah. Was like, there's, there's a whole, like every, every time I'm somewhere, they're like, I don't get it. I don't get your Gmail. I'm like, just don't worry about don't it. You still, is that you're still your Gmail? Well, that's like my oldest okay. Gmail. Like I have multiple Gmails okay. now because there's just too much spam in the world. But. Yeah. It's not your official account, Tiger, Tiger Media. No, it's not my official anymore. <laughs> It used to be, but <laughs> nice. So, what is your favorite thing in DC to photograph? Then, because you're out there all the time. I'm out there all the time. Um, you know, a lot of times I'm going to the Kathleen Lincoln Memorial because I'm not sure how the weather's going to pan out, and I'm not sure, and that gives me the most flexibility because the Lincoln. Around. Well, the Lincoln Memorial, <laughs> you can turn around. You can turn around. Like the Lincoln Memorial, you know, if like the clouds are all really low to the horizon, you can get up high and you can kind of get those vistas. 
Or if you get just like the sky explodes, you can really get like cool reflections and everything, and it gives you the most flexibility. Um, I personally really love Great Falls. If I had a car, I'd go there more often. Um, yeah, I can't believe how much you get out with no car. <laughs> yeah, that's Uber's, you know, Uber's Uber. It it's is what it is. They love you. Uh, I'm sure they do. Um, but I, you know, I really, I really do love them all. I think because it's so much this kind of like blend of landscape and architecture. Um, mm -hmm. And the tidal basin is, is one of my favorite spots too, just cause there's, there's so many great like leading lines and swooping curves mm -hmm. in the tidal basin that kind of help contrast with that kind of like very clear organized structure of like the rest of the mall. Um, I don't get to it as much as I like to, but or I would like to, but the Air Force Memorial is also fun to oh, photograph. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's so tall that it makes it a challenge. Yeah. I think that's why I chose to do the my eclipse photo from the Air Force oh. Memorial. Because um, it's just like different and I don't get there enough. Yeah. But oh, and the angle's really good for like Well, it yeah, it just so happened that like you got the spot and you could literally get the eclipse moving into the Air Force Memorial. So it was like it kind of worked out. That's nice. Wow, you're yeah. really planning ahead. <laughs> so yeah, that's where that's where like apps are amazing. Like you yeah. can literally sit there and like from the comfort of your own mm -hmm. home, like figure out exactly where sun the sun's gonna pop the horizon and then like I mean, there's some amazing I mean, there's some amazing people doing stuff that is far more planning than I take into, you know, about placing the sun, you know, like there's those days you can get the sun right behind the Capitol and yeah. like coming mm -hmm. through the windows of the Capitol dome. Yeah. Or I did. I don't know. I came upon this upon this by accident. But like one day, I was at the Capitol reflecting pool. I think we were all there, and I turned around, and the shadow of the Capitol dome was on the Washington Monument. So it's like I, just I those little alignments. That. Oh, that sounds cool. Yeah. Wow. I didn't get a good photo of it, but like yeah. it was just like you saw the little outline of the statue wow. and everything on the yeah. monument. So it's like all the I think I would remember that crazy wow. <laughs> planning all of those things. But um, I don't know. The technology makes it easy. Yeah. Yeah. Easier. Well, speaking of Tile Basin, you're always one of the, the photographers that I love to see go out at Cherry Blossom time, which is coming up. It's going to be a challenge this year because the Jefferson's under construction. But as I'm sure we're, we're going to see you out there pretty much every day. Uh, maybe? Uh, as much as I can. Yeah. As much as I can pull myself out of bed in the morning. <laughs> it's uh, hard. Yeah, it's, it's hard it's to get tough, out there. But sunrise is definitely the best time of day because there's fewer people out there even though there's still a lot of people out during tidal yeah. basin time for sunrise. Um, but you know, I, and I get a lot of comments on some of my Instagram photos when there's construction equipment in the way of things. And you know, this happened a lot when the Capitol was being mm -hmm. renovated and all these things. And oh, yeah. I kind of take the approach of like, it's a moment and it reflects a moment yeah. in time. And of course the photo would be amazing if there were no construction equipment around it. But like, it's funny cause now like people will be like, you know, they're like intrigued by those photos because, you know. Yeah, and I, I, somebody commented one time, they were like, yeah, the, the Lincoln Memorial looks a little soft. And they thought, like, you missed the focus. And I was like, no, it's just construction equipment. <laughs> <laughs> just the <a> scaffolding. <laughs> um, but it's, it, I mean, it, it reflects a moment of time. And I think that's what I like about kind of being landscape focused stuff is it's like everything doesn't have to be perfect. It's, it's reflective of what was happening at that moment and at that time. And it's like, it can just be what it is. And that's right. at the end of the day, that's just really to enjoy deep. being outside. <laughs> I do think you embrace that though, too. When you look at, when, when someone looks at your tidal basin photos, you focus in on the challenges that the tidal basin even sees today with rising sea levels. Yeah. So there's a lot of, they're trying very hard to repair a lot around the tidal basin. So I think I'm always well, intrigued I mean, on how you capture despite, that. Despite as like, concerning it is about rising sea level and everything i mean when the flood when the water comes over the sidewalk there's some really cool photos right. where like <laughs> the roots of the trees are like reaching into the water and it's like it's a there's some like i one year i don't know i was there for sunrise and the sunrise was awful but i got some really like i just put like and that was right after i got in this new film camera i put black and white film in the film camera i have some beautiful images from that morning and i think I, and I'm not even as good as this as like uh, other photographers I know, but like taking advantage of what's there and making something beautiful out of less than ideal conditions. I think that's the challenge and that's the fun part. Mm -hmm. Like you go out, you may have a morning that, you know, Skyfire said it was going to 85% chance of a good sunrise and it's not. You're right? always burned by that. 
<laughs> or it's like, or it's like you go out and it was like, I think one morning we went out, it was like a 20% chance. And I was like, dude, we're going out anyway. And it was great. Awesome. Yeah. Like, so it's, it's sometimes it's just like a complete crap shoot. And you're just like, that's where like, I, I don't know, even if you're, even if you're not sure you're going to go out for sunrise, get up, look at the yeah. weather, open your front door, look outside and see what's actually happening. And then just make a gut call and. Is that how you know know. about fog, like just the weather, the weather app or like, how do you know? Yeah, I I mean, weather underground is like my favorite weather app and they're, they, so they've, and you can build a a percentage or no, they just, I mean, they'll give you a prediction when there's going to be fog. I mean, so it's looking at that and we get an alert or I think you can set up a, I forget. I don't necessarily get alerts. I just like, I just like check it. You're always in I'm just always on it. (laughs) Yeah. I just check it when I get up in the morning. They call you. I wish (laughs) that would be, that would be way, be awesome. Um, Yeah. I I don't know. When in doubt, go out. Like that was, (laughs) that's like, like just get out there. And like I said, even if it's a day. You planned way too much for this uh, podcast. (laughs) You have way too many, way too many quotable things. (laughs) Just like your travels. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's, I don't know. It's even if you don't get a photo, you were out. Yeah. And it's always like a great experience. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's even great. When, it's especially great when you're in a place where there are other people that are out doing the same thing as you are like you guys. And like, you know, you're always going to run into Angela in the morning. <laughs> um, you know, you know, yeah. I think I see Zach more for sunset than sunrise, mm-hmm. but I still see Zach for sunrise every once in a while. So yeah. it's, there's a lot of people out that get to know and get to see. And you met a lot of people through IGDC, which uh, is, is, what was your first, do you remember your first IGDC meetup? Ooh, first IGDC meetup. I think it might have been light painting at Roosevelt Island. Mm. I think that might have been the first one, probably. Yeah, I think it might have been the first one that you guys did at Roosevelt Island. Um, Yeah, I think that was it. I don't remember, though. You missed that one. Yeah, I was not there. Yeah, I don't think I don't think you were there because it, it was like I don't. I think I don't it was remember, a couple later. That, I don't remember when we met, but yeah, I don't either. <laughs> oh, great! It I don't know because all, all the all the ins, I don't know that sometimes you meet the so many, meets you like meet so many people. Yeah, you meet so many people when you come to those that it's it's a challenge to. <laughs> did you did you go to any photography meetups before that or like Flickr or five hundred PX? I had been to. Well, I was. I don't know. I don't actually, is meetup still a thing? Yeah. Because I was on a, there was like a, there was like a DC photographers group in meetup for a while. And I think I have a feeling it's still there. That's how IGDC started is through meetup.com. And so there was something that I was on, I was on with a bunch of things and kind of got introduced to IGDC, DC focused. And I think those were the two primary ones. I was like going to things Mm -hmm. for a little bit. Um, Yeah. It was all after I'd moved to DC. It was not, I didn't, I didn't really, I was not really aware of that when I was back in the Midwest. Like, I don't know. Wait, like when meetups. did you move to D.C.? So I moved to D.C. Well, I, so I interned in D.C. in 2010. Uh-huh. And then I came back. So I went back, finished my last year of my master's, and then moved here in 2011. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. So the year we started. Yeah. The year you got your camera. Yeah, the year I got my camera. <laughs> like, all, all the magic happened. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, yeah, so I don't know. IGDC has been great because it's, there's more, there's a lot of variation in what you've worked really hard to kind of set up in terms of like all those different things that we get to do, whether it's stuff at the Hirschhorn or stuff like Roosevelt Island or just like random like meetups for Cherry Blossom or whatever. Like it's been that one, IGDC has been really a lot of fun in helping meet people mm-hmm. um, that are also interested in photography. Yes. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if we can top that. Wow. That was yeah, that was good. Great t- 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 good way to go out. We didn't pay you that much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it's been great chatting, Mark, I guess. Uh, do we have any questions or? I think we covered a lot of ground. Yeah, your whole so, life yeah. encompassed. Yeah. And then yeah. uh, once you become infamous, we're going to have to have another. <laughs> infamous. <laughs> Renowned. It's what? Famous. No, I'm saying. No, no he's, he's saying oh, once, once when the, you do your serial killing. Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. yeah. They'll be playing this clip on the news. Like he's like, just go out. He seemed fine. <laughs> he seemed well adjusted. He seemed so nice. Yeah. I just want to uh, thank everybody for listening and uh, remember to uh, follow Mark on. Do you want to shout out anything for people to follow you on or? Uh, you know, I'm. I think I'm on just about everything. So whatever your preferred <laughs> Mark, is, Mark like, Allen Andre. Yeah, Mark Allen Andre on <laughs> or Tiger. Pretty much Ooh. every platform. And there are only a few, like, I'm really, really active on Instagram, but I post stuff pretty frequently to Flickr, to 500px, to all those different ones. So it's, 
Whatever. If you ever have a gear is. question, he's your man. Like, yeah, I, I, I will. I will warn you. I have opinions, but <laughs> um, you know, I'm. You know, I get a lot of questions about gear, about you know, what should I do? I'm I'm trying to trying to do this, and I'm my first um, response is always going to be, is what are you trying to do? Like, I'm not going to tell everybody you need to go buy a full frame camera. Like, that's not true at all. But if you're trying to get into photography, I'm happy to be a resource and happy to you know, provide, provide a thought or two. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank, thank you, Mark. Awesome. Thank uh, you. And if this is your first time listening to an IGDC podcast, uh, check us out on Instagram. The username is IGDC. There's meetups and photo features and other things like that. And uh, thanks for listening. Thanks for coming. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Handshake. <laughs> Official. <laughs>